On July 20th, 1969, humanity reaches a new frontier. Now, nothing seems impossible. In a Toronto suburb, June Callwood wants her youngest son, Casey, to cherish the moment. We had an outlet in our garage, and I carried out our television set and plugged it in. Instead of putting him to bed, the two of us sat there, side by side, and we watched Armstrong land, put his foot down on the moon. We could see the moon up above us. It was magical. The two of us knew we would remember it for the rest of our lives. After that, I thought that civilization was going to get nicer. In Alberta, Mike Steinhauer, a Cree, also watches, but what he sees foreshadows an ominous future. These are some of the prophecies of our people, that in time a white man was going to go to the moon and would make the spirit in the moon angry. I knew that things would never be the same again. That same night in the Gas Bay, 20-year-old Lise Balsé and other young revolutionaries are not watching television. It's not what's going on in space that interests them. It's what's happening on Earth. Many colonized countries were struggling for their independence. We felt part of that international movement. Our cause was for an independent Quebec. This is the story of a time when anything seems possible. When progress has become a religion. When people believe there are no bounds to the inventiveness of human beings. A time when the young do their own thing and want to save the world. When women fight for equal rights and First Nations claim their ancestral heritage. This is the moment when Canada asserts its identity to the world just as it slides into one of the worst crises in its history. A time when Canadians must choose between conflicting visions of their future, and when excess of all kinds leads to a sobering awakening. mid-1960s in small cities like Orillia, Ontario, summer is a wonderful time to be young. In the past few years, the young have been coming here by the thousands. Not everybody is thrilled to see them. They went down to our beautiful uh, Lake Kutchising Beach Park. They slept on the park. They drove their cars over the park lawn and when they got to drinking, they broke their bottles up against our beautiful uh, Champlain Monument. Of course, there are a few people uh, who think that anyone who wears a beard is a beatnik, which uh, 
is not so. These were all college and university students. They're here for the Mariposa Folk Festival to hear rising stars like Ian and Sylvia. Folk music is the new craze. It's simpler, more authentic than rock and roll. Sharon Hampson was 17 when she left high school to become a folk singer. She performs at the first Mariposa concerts. It was a laid back, a pleasurable environment. People were just happy. There was a sense of camaraderie of people being in it together, sharing an experience. This is music with a message. Performers like Nova Scotian Al Cromwell stoke the fires of a generation's youthful idealism. For Sharon Hampson, it's a call to action. I grew up in an environment of political action, so the idea of people singing together about social issues was not unusual for me. What was outstanding for me was that it was becoming mainstream. I felt that there was power in people working together to make the world a better place. It's a new egalitarian culture. In smoky coffee houses like Toronto's Bohemian Embassy, the young poet Margaret Atwood tries out her work. It wasn't very big and it was nice and dark in there. And also there were people who were worse than you, but I have to say not by much. You clapped when they read, and they clapped when you read. Come, my brothers. Let us govern Canada. Let us find our serious heads. From Bob Dylan to Leonard Cohen, art has become a form of subversion and revolution. Let us dump asbestos on the White House. <laughs> Let us encourage the dark races so they'll be lenient when they take over. In the mid-60s, more Canadians than ever, over 200,000, attend university. It is here they are exposed to different and sometimes radical ideas. They found groups like the Student Union for Peace Action, which becomes the core of a movement, the New Left. James Laxer at Queen's University in Kingston is part of it. Being young was everything in this society. It was huge. And being young meant you had power. And you didn't hesitate to tell people in the older generation what was what. And many students like Laxer are awakened to nationalism. In a seminal book, philosopher George Grant warns that Canada is losing its identity. The British fact in Canada did make people know very clearly, in a clear way. They, they took for granted, it was in their, in their bellies, whatever it was, that they were different from Americans. Now, a lot of Canadians now do not see the difference. Laxer reads it through the night. I was already in some sense a nationalist, but this gave me a coherent view that there was a consistent body of ideas that distinguished Canada from the United States and made Canada a country worth saving. In 1965, you no longer need a philosopher to see the difference. America goes to war in Vietnam. This distant war will touch the hearts and minds of a whole generation. It is not a time for diatribe. It is a time for dialogue. The world is changing, but not in the way they had hoped. In Quebec, a new homegrown culture is flowering. It's in the Boite à Chanson with Claude Gauthier, Pauline Julien, and Gilles Vigneault. 
Seismic changes are happening everywhere. In a span of 10 years, half the population turns its back on the church. The very existence of Canada is now openly challenged. A quarter of Quebecers now favor independence. The Lesage government is swept up in this tide of rising expectations, and René Lévesque is right at the heart of it. The government's first target, private power companies. C'est au peuple du Québec de prendre dans ses mains, librement et fièrement, la première et la plus importante de toutes les clés d'une économie moderne. Et ça, ça veut dire la nationalisation de l'électricité. This is an open challenge to the English private companies that had been coddled under the long Duplessis regime. The plan is wildly popular. In some rural areas, the cost of power is three times what it is in Montreal, and sometimes it's unreliable. The 11 private power companies fight back. J.A. Fuller, president of Shawinigan Power, warns. The idea that a state-owned monopoly would automatically bring greater efficiency and lower rates is a fallacy. Government opponents insinuate that Levesque is another Fidel Castro. But the floodgates are open. The government finds itself spearheading a quiet revolution. And no one knows where it will lead. Since the very first days of New France, the Catholic Church has educated the young. In the early 60s, half leave school before they are 15. It is one of the worst dropout rates in Canada. Juliette Gagnon taught for many years in a rural Quebec school. Here in the country, it was the exception that could go on beyond sixth grade. People said that to pick up rocks and work the land, they didn't need an education. Micheline Poirier is growing up in a working class Montreal neighborhood. I was the youngest in a family of 10 children. My parents were blue collar workers. I was hoping to go on to higher education, but my parents didn't have the money. Claude Briette is a priest teaching in a classical college near Montreal. Our mission was to train the elite. We had some sons of working class people. To be able to get financial help, they had to have a recommendation from the parish priest. The first outcry comes from a teaching brother. The impertinences of Brother Anonymous excoriates the quality of public education. It is a huge bestseller. His name is Jean-Paul Desbien, and his criticism is not appreciated by the church. His order sends him off to Europe for three years of reflection. Education becomes the Lesage government's next crusade. It sets out to wrest control from the church. Youth Minister Paul Gérin Lajoie is assigned to do it. We were concerned by the reality of the moment, and this reality was brutal and easy to see. Quebec's education system was not up to the needs of the 20th century. Bishop Maurice Roy, the primate of the Catholic Church in Canada, defends the church's historic hold on education. There are, in this great enterprise, established a hundred years ago, guiding principles that cannot be changed without endangering its solidity. But the government refuses to back down. Within a few years, a new system is born. Huge comprehensive high schools spring up everywhere. Claude Briette has left his small classical college and now teaches in Montreal. I arrived at Edouard Montpetit High School the year it opened. I was coming from a school of 300 students to one where there were almost 2,000 of them. What a difference. 
But the education reform upsets a way of life that is centuries old. In the countryside, Juliette Gagnon sees the mood change. What people complained most about was the introduction of new taxes. They started calling Mr. Lesage, Tijan la tax. Maurice Duplessis's old party, the Union Nationale, feeds off the resentment. In the countryside, it lashes out against the yellow peril, the school buses that pick up farm children at dawn and bring them home after dark. In 1966, the Union Nationale upsets Lesage's liberals. But the new premier, Daniel Johnson, will not turn back the clock. The quiet revolution will go on. Progress has become a religion. In its name, politicians, social engineers, and urban planners are reshaping the country. The sky is the limit. They believe they can alter nature. And displace entire populations. W.A.C. Bennett is Premier of British Columbia. He opens the interior to forestry and mining companies. He builds highways, launches huge hydroelectric projects. One of his mega projects is the damming of the Columbia River to generate power for the American market. The deal brings the province $275 million in its first 30 years. Now this is great for Canada and great for British Columbia. This is no sellout. This is a genuine good business deal. But one of the dams threatens to flood 600 families, some whose ancestors settled there at the turn of the century. If somebody could kill me off and the land would still be safe, I would very willingly uh, finish my but they can do nothing against an all-powerful government. 2,500 men, women, and children must leave. There was six of us fishing and God men you'll know. There was Elijah and Harry and James Legros. At the other end of the country, Newfoundland Premier Joey Smallwood is moving people too. The outports, small fishing villages all along the coast, are being closed down. Entire villages take to the sea. The residents and their homes are being relocated in larger communities. Some 250 outports vanish and 30,000 people are resettled. I think we will get through better here because it is work for the children. I'm getting settled down now. We have a new home. And eventually, I'll get a car. So if I hold my health, I'll be thankful. This is our new land and this is our new home. Everything will be OK. I'm quite contented now with what I'm going to do in any case. Quite contented with it. The old days is over. Now they will have roads, electricity, and schools. But it is the end of a way of life that endured for centuries. What can I do? I never worked on the land. I went on the water when I was 13 years old, now I'm 60. It's happening in cities too. In Toronto and Montreal, whole neighborhoods, mostly working class, are raised in the name of progress. In Halifax, it's the city's oldest black neighborhood that is targeted. Over the hills and 
Some families have been here for more than 150 years. Many are descendants of American slaves who fled north to Nova Scotia. Go tell it on the years of official neglect and racism have made Africville one of the worst slums in the country. The city decides the residents must be moved. In terms of the physical conditions of buildings and sanitation, the story is deplorable. There are only two things to be said. The families will have to be rehoused in the future. The land, which they occupy, will be required for the future development of the city. But to its people, Africville is a community. For young Terry Dixon, it is a warm and safe place. Anywhere you go, anywhere you fall down, you hurt yourself, you don't have to go home. You just go to the nearest house and have that taken care of. Africville's residents are not wealthy, but they are proud. Most believe that they own their land and the house in which they live. You're in this country and you own a piece of property, you're not a second class citizen. But very few actually have a deed to prove their ownership. They are stunned when they learn they must leave. Halifax Mayor John Edward Lloyd justifies the city's decision by invoking the end of segregation and humanitarian reasons. And sometimes, some people need to be shown that certain things are not in their own best interest. What is being done, or what is being done in the total public interest, including the best welfare of these people themselves and their children. The residents find out the city doesn't recognize their property claim. It offers most of them only symbolic compensation for their land and homes. Daisy Carvery, a mother of five, is enraged. They got the older people together because they simply knew that the older people didn't have any education. What is $500 to a 75-year-old Negro? He thinks he's rich. They took our homes. They moved us out of Africville. The city moved us out of Africville in the city garbage trucks. Eventually, all had to leave. The last to go was 72-year-old Aaron Paw Carvery. The day I left my home, part of me inside died. If I had been a little younger, the city would never have gotten my land. In the early 60s, many women have jobs, but on average, most earn two-thirds of what men earn for the same work. Most working women are single. A female boss is a rare bird indeed. Doris Anderson wants to be editor of Chatelaine magazine, but it looks as if a man will get the job. They thought, oh, well, she's getting married and she'll be quitting, but uh, I said I want the job and uh, I'm not going to work for anyone else, so uh, they gave me the job. A year later, she is pregnant. It's considered inappropriate for an obviously pregnant woman to be at work. Her boss feels businessmen working in the same building will be embarrassed by her presence. To keep her job, Doris promises to be discreet. I'll come and go at odd hours, so I won't be too conspicuous. But even that won't do. She keeps the job, but she can't be seen. I worked from home. The staff was running back and forth in cabs with layouts and photographs and artwork. It was ridiculous. The next time she's pregnant, she tells no one. When her boss inevitably notices, he confronts her. 
He said, when are you going home? I said, I'm going home the day after I have this baby. He threw up his hands and didn't do anything about it. And by the time I had my third child, there were pregnant women all over McLean Hunter. Life is even tougher for women in politics. In the last 40 years, a handful of women have been elected to office. It's 1957 before a woman, Ellen Fairclough, becomes a federal cabinet minister. In Quebec, women face unusual hurdles. In 1961, lawyer Claire Kirkland Casgrain is the first woman elected to the legislature. I was considered a bit of a novelty. Who was this woman who had dared to run for a political party and had managed to get elected? What did she have to say? What did she think? And unfortunately, what will she wear? Fashion is the least of her problems. She needs to rent an apartment in Quebec City. But as a married woman, she has the same legal status as a child. The landlord won't deal with her. My husband had to sign the contract to make it legal. I was a member of the legislature and a lawyer, but I could not sign a lease. Under Quebec's civil code, married women are deemed incapable. They cannot open a bank account or authorize medical care for their children. Claire Kirkland Casgrain now can do something about that. Cette notion de la puissance paternelle est dépassée depuis longtemps et qu'il est temps de lui substituer un concept nouveau, celui de la puissance parentale qui viendra consacrer le caractère d'association, le caractère de partnership qui doit exister entre l'homme et la femme au sein d'une famille bien organisée. She gets the law changed. By 1964, married women in Quebec are no longer treated.